With this latest episode of Delicious and Dungeon, I kind of feel like it's the most heartbreaking thing we've seen in this anime to date. And it's kind of weird to say that because the show kicks off with the main character's sister being ate and killed seemingly. But when they tell you that she's probably going to be okay as long as you get to her in a month's time, it's hard to be like, oh, that's definitely a heartbreaking moment. That's more like, well, I guess that's a day in the dungeon for you. I find what happened with Senshi in this episode completely tragic because this Kelpie bamboozled him, manipulated him. And I love the idea that for a dwarf who literally has no interest in magic, he's a very practical guy. You don't take the easy way out when it comes to cooking. And he probably views magic in a similar way. Why blast something with a fireball when you can use your own two hands and take care of a monster? Using magic to cross the water, that's not for him. He uses his like really nice like horn and it summons this beautiful Kelpie. Now Kelpies generally aren't something to be trusted. There's been very few cases where it's worked out, at least from media that I've consumed. I know in the latest God of War game, that worked out well, the Kelpie was just fine and it, everything was fine. Ancient Magus Bri, very different experience, so, I mean, I, I just kind of believed it would be okay, because, I don't know, I feel like Senshi knows his stuff, and I was like, if he has a magical steed that he can summon, I kind of believe him, and I guess he would rather, if it's going to be magical, you know, have like an actual connection with something rather than just using some spell he can't see. And the fact that this Kelpie, for God knows how long, you just see how heartbroken he is. Sure, he just goes back to town, like, he's like, okay, let's cut this up, let's get the meat going. But he is visibly hurt, 100%, because imagine thinking that this thing, every time you summoned it or it was around, you thought it was bonding with you, when all it was doing was trying to lure you onto its back so it could take you into the depths of the ocean. And that's pretty heartbreaking, honestly. And the thing too, just to add onto this comment, the idea that even if it was during those times actually friends, like looking at Senshi as a pal, someone not to her, the fact that a monster can't really be tamed. You don't really know a monster's intentions. It's entirely possible that there was times that he generally looked at Senshi as a friend, and this time, because he was hungry, he looked at him as prey. We can't fully know for sure, and I think that's part of the beauty of a scene like that, is not knowing whether it was all a trick, or if it was genuine and just a monster can't fully be tamed. In very delicious and dungeon fashion, they don't just make it a tearjerker and then just say the whole episode's mood's gonna be killed. But the way they can so easily show such a vulnerable side to a character while continuing the character's arc as per usual is some really great character writing. Now I have a full live reaction of this week's episode of Delicious and Dungeon over on my Patreon, so if you want to see my full income thoughts as we watch today's very packed episode, it's over there for your interest. And I mean, when you see three little titles in the actual title on Netflix, I mean, you know this was going to be a good episode. Like, this was basically a three-parter. And honestly, between that group who I thought was dead and down for the count, thinking, okay, they stole our gold, to then finding them somehow ahead of us, and once again, down for the count, we have the whole uh, Kelpie situation, we fight a Kraken, and uh, we... <sighs> We have the worst thing they ate yet. I still think the alien spunk ice cream goo that they were eating. I ain't eaten no alien jam that's looking like that from a couple episodes ago. It's just, it's just weird to me. It makes me feel weird. But I would slurp down an alien burger any day of the week, then eat a tapeworm grilled up. That's what they ate. The parasite inside the Kraken is basically a tapeworm or anything like that. And they cut that thing, they fillet it, they sear that, and it looks good cooked. Eat the Kraken. Jesus Christ. Do not eat the tapeworm. That's what it was. The, out of everything that we've seen, I feel like this is going to be the universally agreed, like, maybe we crossed a line. I mean, there's always, like, when we have these cooking moments, I feel like for anyone who says it's gross, or you're going to find someone who says, yeah, I'm going to eat it. And it makes sense. They make it look good. And honestly, the curiosity of people, hell, the curiosity in our own world of what some people eat. But the idea of pulling a parasite out of a giant sea creature and eating that is just, I just assume what's going to happen is what happens to Leos at the end of the episode. Now, granted, it's because he ate the raw squid or whatever. And basically, uh, that parasite's now gnawing at his insides. But, like, I don't care if you cook it. I don't care if it's 100% safe. That shit is disgusting and just so unnatural. But I think that's part of the fun of the cooking is trying to see, like, okay, everything they're pretty much cooking is usually not, like, visually appealing at the start. Or you feel like your natural instinct is, like, Marcel, who's like, hell no. But I feel like the idea of, like, saying, would you eat? Because there's certain situations, like, okay, you'll die if you don't eat it. Yeah, I'll eat the damn grilled parasite sure but give me a goddamn octopus tentacle i would much rather eat that hell i would much rather eat the numerous fish in the damn body of water that we can still eat i ain't eating that that's that's all i'm saying 
But there was a lot that happened in this episode, even beyond those couple of things. Now, I love the idea that this is a show that can introduce a plot point that you would figure has to be relevant the next episode or the very minimum two episodes later. When our boy got that sword, which is literally alive, we've had a couple of reactions like, wait a second, is that did that sword do something? But it has yet to be a major plot point, and I kind of love that. Because when is it going to be relevant? I have no idea, but he's keeping a pretty interesting secret, and I don't know if that will be a good thing or a bad thing long term for the party, so I'm pretty excited for that. The most unexpected moment, not that they were alive, because I saw a lot of people and I kind of agreed with it, I was like, okay, you know, given the type of people they are, they have kind of bumped into people and help, probably someone's going to come along and help them. Turns out that group was just paralyzed, and they kind of think that they got robbed, not knowing that the treasure bugs are, well, what they are. It's interesting, because I thought the gag was going to be that because they were probably a day or so ahead, you know, our characters anyway, that maybe like they'd constantly tag and then we'd have this like meetup, maybe they'd get a little feisty. And instead we find them in the body of water. They're just face first. And I'm like, are they trying to make a gag out of this group thinking they're trying to track down who they think robbed them? Just show me every episode them face first somewhere. I, I don't know if they're going to do more with these characters, but that's kind of a funny gag, all things considered. I also like the idea that, you know, <laughs> part of the reason magic doesn't work too well on our dwarven friend is because he doesn't really wash his beard that well, seemingly, and all of the things from different monsters and experiences are just kind of coating that thick group of hair. And, uh, well, when you try to make a dwarf who's kind of filthy walk on water, he sinks to the bottom of the ocean, and the idea that once you use the fat from the Kelpie, of course, which she made into a soap, uh, he got rather clean, and goddamn, the fluffiness of his beard. I love that how straight it was, because it was wet to then, you know, she uses a little magic on a fire, and then she's combing it, almost like a, a makeshift blow dryer in a way. Just so cool, I love the little moments and how they do it, and how, you know, each of these characters in our central crew, they, they have so much personality and so much character, and they honestly disagree a fair amount about a lot of things, but they feel like they are a true group of friends who better the other's lives. Sometimes they push the others outside their comfort zone, maybe in ways that you shouldn't, like you shouldn't be eating a parasite that's basically a tapeworm, but when in Rome, I suppose. But in general, like, Marcel being the type of character who generally is just like, so, ugh, what are, what are we doing? This is disgusting, this, that, and the third. She had one face when they were, like, cutting up the Kelpie, and she was, like, stirring something into a pot, but she did it away from him. She's usually the type of character who's just, like, at the end of the episode with the parasite, right? Like, she's talking mad shit for obvious reasons. But the idea that her friend was hurting... Her friend was not happy in this moment, and she made sure not to make a scene because, oh, here we are once again, we're gonna eat horse meat or something. No, like, she was very respectful, and I love the fact that a guy like Senshi isn't gonna just start crying and, you know, kicking his feet and giving up. He's visibly heartbroken about that scene, and he thinks he's a fool, most of all. He thinks he's an idiot, like someone as wise as him should know that he shouldn't have trusted this thing. You know, the idea that it allows for him to get out of that slump rather quickly, especially when she made such a nice gift for him to clean his beard, not because, like, she was saying you're disgusting, but, like, this is a big reason why magic's not gonna work on you. And after being betrayed by the thing that he thought would let him cross the body of water, he's had no reason to deny. That's the type of character writing you love to see in a show like this. That is one part slice of life, adventuring through a dungeon, showing all these fancy elements you love. One part cooking anime that somehow makes everything look pretty damn good, even though most of it's pretty damn god awful. And then one part action kind of fantasy anime. I love how they blended everything, and it's such a well produced show. Like, whether it's the animation on Marcel's like pants, like blowing up from the wind, like just how it's like baggy, almost making it look like she's in the anime Moggy. Just such a good sh episode, such a good show. I loved what I saw, but let me know what you thought down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you're new around here, of course, ring that bell, and like I mentioned, we had that full live reaction over on my Patreon, and hey, while you're over there, I'll also give you a video shout out. So today, we have Bennett Riser, Refact972, Michael Latham, Sleeping Knight, Tom Robert, and Riptide. So I appreciate the support, everyone. Please take care and have a good one.